प्रियदर्शनी वेलकम टू माई चैनल अभी तक जो भी मैंने वीडियोस बनाए हैं आई होप आपको हेल्पफुल हो रहे होंगे प्रीवियस वीडियोस मैंने एलिमेंट्री कैनल और डाइजेस्टिव प्लांट्स पे बनाए हैं आई हैव पुट द लिंक इन द डिस्क्रिप्शन सेक्शन टूडेज टॉपिक इज फिजियोलॉजी ऑफ डाइजेशन लेट्स फर्स्ट हैव अ ब्रीफ आइडिया ऑन द फिजियोलॉजी ऑफ डाइजेशन फर्स्ट वील डिस्कस अबाउट एब्सॉर्प्शन एंड डाइजेशन ऑफ द कार्बोहाइड्रेट्स फैट्स proteins and then we'll discuss about assimilation and digestion so let's start our topic physiology of digestion first basic mechanism of digestion carbohydrates fats proteins and nucleic acids occur in food in the form of large and complex insoluble macromolecules or polymers The polymers are made up of small soluble subunit molecules called monomers. The monomers in the polymers of these foods are held together by anhydro bonds. Anhydro bonds means bonds formed by the removal of water. When polymers are made to react with water in the presence of enzymes, these polymers break down into monomers. This is their digestion. Chemically, it is their hydrolysis. In other words digestion is the process in which polymers of carbohydrates fats proteins and nucleic acids are broken down into monomers by addition of water with the help of enzymes these enzymes are called hydrolases large variety of digestive enzymes are found in omnivores hydrolases are of four types carbohydrases proteinases lipases and nucleases first carbohydrates carbohydrate digestive enzymes amylases split polysaccharides into disaccharides which is starch into maltose sucrose isomaltose dextrins in the picture in the slide you can see how it is broken down disaccharides are split by maltase sucrase lactase isomaltase into monosaccharides which is glucose fructose galactose now proteinase it is a protein digesting enzymes proteinases are generally released in inactive form because their active form would hydrolyze cellular and extracellular proteins of organisms in the absence of food here you can see proteins when proteinase enzymes react they form amino acids in the proteases are made in three places stomach pancreas small intestine now lipases here lipase enzymes breaks the lipid into glycerol and fatty acid and nucleases deoxyribonuclease and ribonuclease split dna and rna into deoxyribonucleotides and ribonucleotides respectively nucleotidases convert nucleotides into leukocytes and inorganic phosphate nucleoside bases split nucleosides into nitrogen bases and pentose sugar first we'll see digestion of carbohydrates carbohydrates are of three kinds polysaccharides disaccharides and monosaccharides polysaccharides and disaccharides are broken into monosaccharides during the process of digestion starch and cellulose are polysaccharides that are present in cereal grains potato tubers and fruits sucrose which is present in cane sugar maltose in malta and lactose in milk are disaccharides enzyme which act on carbohydrates are called as carbohydrases digestion of carbohydrates in the oral cavity what is the action of saliva in oral cavity the food is mixed with saliva the saliva contains an enzyme called salivary amylase or tylen which converts starch into maltose isomaltose and small dextrins called alpha dextrins lysosome present in the saliva acts as an antibacterial enzyme remember lysozyme present in active saliva acts as an antibacterial enzyme here you can see starch with salivary amylase forms dextrins plus maltose and sugar bicarbonate ions in saliva neutralize the acids in food the thiocyanate ions of saliva act as micro antimicrobial agent and prevents infection by the microbes that often enter into the food 
mucus of the saliva moistens and dissolves some of the food and lubricates the esophagus. Salivary amylase is absent in the saliva of many herbivorous, herbivorous mammals like cow, buffalo and predatory carnivorous mammals like lions and tigers. However, saliva of pigs contains salivary amylase. Now in the small intestine. In response to the action of stimuli received from the vagus nerve which is the 10th carnival nerve and secretin a gastrointestinal hormone, the Brunner's gland secrete a large amount of viscous enzyme-free alkaline and watery mucoid fluid. The, this secretion enables the duodenum to withstand the acidic chymes entering the stomach until it is neutralized by the alkaline pa pancreatic juice and bile. The mucus is secreted by the mucus cells whereas water and electrolytes are secreted by the enterocytes present on the intestinal crypts as we have learned earlier. First the action of pancreatic juice. The pancreatic juice contains starch digesting enzyme called pancreatic alpha amylase which converts starch into maltose, isomaltose and alpha dextrins. Bicarbonate of the pancreatic juice neutralizes hydrochloric acid of the chyme that enters the duodenum starch here you can st see starch when reacts with the pancreatic alpha amylase forms maltose isomaltose and alpha dextrins now the action of intestinal juice intestinal juice contains maltase isomaltase sucrase lactase and alpha dextrinase which act as follows maltose when comes in contact with maltase it gives two molecules of glucose. Isomaltose when reacts with isomaltase it forms glucose plus another glucose. Sucrose when reacts with sucrase forms glucose plus fructose. When lactose reacts with lactase it forms glucose plus galactose. Then alpha dextrins when react with alpha dextrinase it forms glucose. Only human being can digest lactose present in the milk, but with advancing age, they produce little or no lactase. In such persons, the lactose of milk remains undigested and is fermented in the intestine, producing gases and acids. This results in flatulence, intestinal cramps, and diarrhea. So, these persons should take yogurt or curd as lactose is fermented in lactic acid in them. This doesn't pose any digestive problem to them. Now the digestion of proteins. Proteins are made up of amino acids. So proteins are broken down to amino acids during the process of digestion. Enzymes that hydrolyze proteins are called as proteases. Many of these enzymes are secreted in their inactive form called proenzymes as their active forms would hydrolyze cellular and extracellular proteins of organisms itself. Inactive forms of enzymes are converted to their active forms at the site of their actions. Saliva doesn't contain any protein digestive enzyme, so the digestion of pro proteins doesn't occur in the oral cavity. However, saliva can denature the uncooked pr natural proteins such as the present in raw egg, unboiled milk or uncooked germinating seeds. So let's see the digestion of proteins in the stomach. The stomach normally stores the food for 4 to 5 hours. The gastric glands of the stomach secret gastric juice. It contains HCL, proenzymes pepsinogen and proreneine. HCL maintains a strong acidic pH of about 1.2 2.5 in the stomach. pH of infants gastric juice is 5 which is slightly alcohol, uh, acidic. Sorry. HCL kills the bacteria and other harmful organisms that may be present along with the food. HCL converts pepsinogen and proreneine into pepsin and renin respectively. Once pepsin is formed, in, it changes the pepsinogen into pepsin. Such an activation is called as autocatalytic reaction. Pepsin and renin are absent in invertebrates. The gastric juice is thoroughly mixed with food until it become, becomes a semi-fluid mass called chyme. Few reactions are summarized below. You can see on the slide. Like pepsinogen when comes in contact with HCL converts into pepsin. These pepsin when reacts with the proteins they convert, prote convert into proteoses and peptones. Uh, similarly, when HCL combines with proreneine it converts it into 
renin and when the casein which is the milk protein comes in with contact with renin it forms paracasein this paracasein forms calcium paracasinate which is curd and when the calcium paracasinate comes in contact with pepsin it forms peptones now the digestion of proteins in the small intestine pancreatic juice contains proenzymes like trypsinogen chymotrypsinogen and procarboxypeptidase and enzyme elastase all these are concerned with proteins digestion the bile provides alkaline medium for various reactions here you can see the trypsinogen when it comes in contact with the enterokinase of intestinal juice it converts it into trypsin the chymotrypsinogen when it comes in contact with trypsin it converts into chymotrypsin the procarboxypeptidase which is a proenzyme when it comes in contact with the trypsin it forms into carboxypeptidase when these proteins comes in contact with the active form of the enzyme trypsin it forms large peptides similarly the proteins and elastins and some few large peptides all of them combine with the active form of the enzymes and form large peptides and dipeptides and amino acids respectively now digestion of fats almost the entire fat portion of the diet consists of triglycerides which is the neutral fat when are, which are made up of three fatty acid molecules and a single glycerol molecule strepsin or the fat digesting enzymes are soluble in water but insoluble in fats and oils the lipase is usually used as a fat digestive enzyme saliva has no lipase so the stomach also lacks any fat emulsifying agent however the gastric juice contains small amount of gastric lipase which converts some fats into monoglycerides and fatty acid fat is largely digested in the small intestine bile salts of the bile break down fat droplets into many small ones by reducing the surface tension of the fat droplets this process is called as emulsification this increase lipase action on fat the lipase is present in the pancreatic juice and intestinal juice the pancreatic lipase is the principal enzyme for the digestion of fat in addition an intestinal lipase is also helpful in the digestion of fat the pancreatic lipase converts emulsified fats which is the triglyceride triglyceride fat first into diglycerides and then monoglycerides releasing a fatty acid at each step the intestinal lipase converts remaining fats into the monoglycerides and fatty acids finally all the fats are converted into fatty acids glycerol and monoglycerides here you can see in the slide everything is explained in step wise the last result is fatty acid and glycerol digestion of nucleic acids the nucleic acids are digested in the small intestine the enzymes which digest nucleic acids are present in the pancreatic juice and intestinal juice the pancreatic juice contains two nucleases which is dnas and rnas which when combined with the nucleic acid forms nucleotides and these nucleotides when combined with nucleotidases they form phosphate and nucleoside and these nucleotidases and nucleosidases are the intestinal are present in the intestinal juice and when the nucleoside reacts with the nucleosidase it forms base and the ribose for example i'll tell with the dna in the previous one when dna reacts with the nucleus which is the dna it forms deoxyribonucleotides the final result is it forms the nitrogenous base which is purine or pyrimidines and pentose sugar the sight smell and presence of food in the gi team act as a stimuli for the secretion of saliva this happens because of the stimulus of vagus nerve the feeling of hunger at a particular time when regularly food is taken is an example of conditional reflex i'll discuss a few role of gastrointestinal hormones the gastrin it is a hormone secreted by the gastrin cells in the pyloric region which stimulates gastric glands to secrete and release the gastric juice um then uh, the secretin 
it was the first hormone to be discovered by the scientist it is secreted by the epithelium of duodenum these are the few questions which may come in a competitors and the next question might be uh, the cholecystokinin pancreozymin this is the uh, this is secreted by the epithelium of the entire small cyst a uh, small intestine it stimulates the gallbladder to release bile and pancreas to secrete and release digestive enzymes in the pancreatic juice and vip which is the vasoactive intestinal peptide it is secreted by the epithelium in the entire small system it dilates peripheral blood vessels of the gut and also inhibits gastric acid secretion villikinin it is secreted by the epithelium of entire small system small intestine and it accelerates the movement of villi villikinin that's the name and the uh, somatostatin uh, the in the earlier video i have explained about somatostatin it is secreted by the delta cells of the isolates of langrens which inhibits the secretion of glucagon by the alpha cells and insulin by the beta cells and now we'll discuss about absorption of nutrients absorption is a process by which nutrients pass from the alimentary canal into the blood and lymph through its mucous membrane amino acids monosaccharides fatty acids glycerol salt vitamins and water are absorbed about 90% of the absorption of nutrients occur in the small intestine the other 10% in the stomach and the large intestine some water salts or alcohol some drugs such as aspirin and moderate amounts of sugar are absorbed in the stomach Here in this slide, you can see the absorption of nutrients in various parts of the gut, and the and the, in the picture you can see what are absorbed in which portion of the body. Water and the products of the bacterial digestion are absorbed in the large intestine. Thus, absorption mainly occurs in the small intestine. Absorption occurs by simple diffusion, osmosis, facilitated transport, and the active transport. first we'll see the absorption of carbohydrates in this slide you can see the epithelial cells of small intestine showing absorption of nutrients the carbohydrates are absorbed as monosaccharides in the stomach and jejunum here you can see the monosaccharides which are absorbed glucose and galactose are absorbed by the active pump of the cell membrane helps in active uptake the most rapidly transported monosaccharide is galactose with glucose running a second the absorption of amino acids is by active transport and some amino acids are absorbed by facilitated transport it occurs mainly in duodenum and jejunum normally 90 to 95% of amino acids are absorbed in the small intestine and they also enter the blood stream here you can see the see the blood capillary capillary now absorption of fatty acids and glucose glycerol the fat soluble vitamins and the absorption of fat are done by simple diffusion fatty acids and glycerols are insoluble in water therefore they cannot reach the blood stream directly they are first incorporated into the small spherical water soluble droplets called micelles which help the bile salts and the phospholipids in the intestinal lumen a micelle is an aggregate of many molecules from the micelle fatty acids glycerides sterols and the fat soluble vitamins are absorbed into the intestinal cells by diffusion when they are resynthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum and are converted into very small fat molecule droplets called micro chylomicrons here you can see the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is there and the formation of chylomicrons which are small fat molecules the latter are released from the intestinal cells into the lymph present in the lymphatic capillaries which is called as the lacteal here you can see the lacteal about 90% of the all water absorption occurs in the small intestine by osmosis from the lumen of the small intestines through epithelial cells and into the blood capillaries in the villi the absorption of the water from the small intestine is associated with the absorption of electrolytes and digested food in order to maintain an osmotic balance with the blood the absorption of water also takes place in the stomach and the large intestine now we will see assimilation and storage 
with ejection. Ejection is also called defecation. The absorption of food materials are transported by the blood and lymph. The lymph is, the f is finally transferred to the blood circulation. The blood transports absorb food materials to different body cells where food materials become integral component of the living protoplasm and are used for energy growth and repair. This is called assimilation of food. Amino acids are not stored but are taken up by the cells in connection with the synthesis of proteins. Proteins are used for growth, repair, etc. Excess amino acids can be converted into the glucose and then to fat and thus stored. This is an irreversible reaction. The amino acids can also be converted to glucose and used as a fuel for the cell. During their conversion to the glucose, the amino acids are deaminated which means the removal of the amino groups. The liver is the chief site for deamination. It is a process, I mean the deamination is a process by, the which, by which the amino group is removed from the amino acids resulting in the production of ammonia. The ammonia is soon converted into urea which is filtered from the blood in the kidney. The excess of monosaccharides which is the glucose, fructose, galactose are usually stored in the liver and muscle cells in the form of glycogen by the process of glycogenesis. Whenever there is a deficiency of glucose in the blood, the glycogen is converted into glucose and the process is called glycogenolysis. The muscle glycogen is utilized during muscle contraction. Glucose is utilized in the production of energy for various body activities. A considerable amount of glucose is converted into fat and stored as such. Now the fat. Fat is stored in the fat deposits of the body such as subcutaneous layers, mesenteries, etc. The fat stored in the readily available source for fuel for the cells. Fat has an important insulating property in connection with the conservation of heat and maintenance of body temperature. Fat also plays a protective role as filling or around packing material and between organs. In liver, phospholipids are formed which are returned to the blood to be used as used by all the cells. In the liver cells, the in liver cells the fats are converted into amino acids and carbohydrates. Vitamins, salts and water are also useful for various metabolic processes. Now we will discuss the ejection. The elimination of fecus from the elementary canal is called as ejection or defecation. The fecus is waste material which is discharged from the elementary canal. Now we will discuss the, what is the mechanism of ejection. Peristalysis gradually pushes the indigestible materials of the small intestine into the intest large intestine or colon. The colon absorbs most of the water, it absorbs electrolytes including sodium and chloride from the chyme. The epithelial cells of the colon also excrete <coughs> certain salts such as iron, calcium from the blood. E. coli lives in the colon which feeds on the undigestive matter. This bacterium in return produces vitamin B12, vitamin K, vitamin B1 and vitamin B2 which are absorbed by the wall of colon. As the pellets of the fecus enter the rectum, the distension of the rectal wall induces the feeling of defecation due to a defecation reflex. This reflex initiates the peristalsis in the last part of the colon which is the sigmoid colon and the rectum forcing the fecus towards the anus. As the fecus reaches anus, involuntary relaxation of the internal anal sphincter and the voluntary relaxation of the external anal sphincter causes defecation. In infants, the defecation occurs by the reflex action without the voluntary control of the external anal sphincter. The fecus consists of about 3 fourth of water and 1 fourth of solid matter. Dead mucosal cells, mucus, cholesterol also occur in the fecus. Its brown color is due to the brown pigments sterobilonegin and sterocobilin which are derivatives or bilirubin. Okay, so this is all about the assimilation, storage and ejection. So this was all about the physiology of digestion. We almost have come to an end of this chapter. In the next video, I will be discussing balanced diet, 
nutritional requirements and disorders of the digestive system. And after that, I will be preparing MCQs. If you have any queries related to this topic, then type in the comment section. And if you like this video, then do like, share and subscribe. Don't forget to hit the bell icon. Thank you.